In this example, we'll go through all the formal steps for a two proportions z-test. A quality inspector finds 12 defective parts in a sample of 300 parts received from manufacturer A. Out of 200 parts from manufacturer B, she finds 10 defective ones. A computer making company uses these parts in their computers and assumes that the quality of parts produced by A and B is the same. Does the data provide evidence the proportions between the two groups are different? Let's compare these two proportions with the formal hypothesis test and confidence interval. We're going to use a significance level, or alpha level, of 0.05. The first step in a formal procedure is that we need to state the question of interest. And in this example, it's whether or not there's a difference in the proportion of defective parts between the manufacturers A and B. And this is just listed up here as well. And basically because they are assuming that the two are the same, if there's evidence based upon our hypothesis that they're not the same, then that's the type of test we want to set up. Next we want to identify the parameter. So we ask ourselves, is our data categorical, quantitative, do we have one or two or more populations. And in this example, our data is categorical. Basically, we have a characteristic that is either defective or not defective. And so that is a characteristic that can only be described using a proportion. So we have a categorical variable. And we have two populations. So we have from parts from manufacturer A and manufacturer B. So this implies that our parameter is going to be P1 minus P2. We're going to find the difference between the population proportions. So we need to find the difference in the population proportions. These are our unknown parameters, which implies that we should then do a two-proportion z-test. So now we want to state the null and alternative hypotheses for our test. Our null hypothesis is always going to be a statement of equality, so we use our parameter p1 minus p2 is equal to zero. Again, statement of equality. This just basically means that um, we're testing whether or not p1 is equal to p2. And the alternative is that P1 minus P2 is not equal to zero. Basically, that they are different. The, the two proportions from the populations are not the same as each other. So P1 minus P2 would not be equal to zero. And we want to know whether or not this is a two, one or two-sided test. This is going to reflect when we want to find our p-value after finding our test statistic, whether or not we should do a one-sided or two-sided p-value. And because we're asking if there's a difference, there's just a not equals in our, al our alternative, this implies this will be a two-sided hypothesis test and a two-sided p-value because we have a two-sided alternative. All right. The next step is that we need to choose the significance level. Well, it's already been chosen for us, so we're going to use alpha equal to 0.01, .01 which implies that we'll do a 99% confidence interval and we'll compare our p-value to a level of 0 0.01 on whether or not we should reject the null hypothesis. Next, we should check the conditions for a two-proportion z-test. First of all, we need to know that the data is random. Our samples random. If we look at to our our example, it says a quality inspector finds that defective parts in a sample of 300 parts received from the manufacturer um, are defective. It actually doesn't say whether or not they're random, so it doesn't tell us So we don't know whether this condition is met, met or not. So we should be maybe assume that they are random, but since we don't know, we're just going to leave that condition as not quite met. All right, the next condition for a two-proportion z-test is whether or not are the number of successes and failures 
in each sample are greater than 10, greater than or equal to 10. And this basically just ensures that our sampling distributions will be normally distributed. We need to take a large enough sample size. And so if the number of successes and failures, and by successes and failures, basically that means the number of things that have the characteristic and the number of things that don't have the characteristic in your sample are both greater than 10. In this example, we have 12 successes in from manufacturer A and 10 successes from manufacturer B. So we have 12 from A and 10 successes from B, which implies if we take a sample of 300 from A that we'd have 288 failures from A and a sample of 200 from B, so that would imply that we'd have 190 failures from B. So both of these conditions are met. We have more than 10 successes and failures from each group. Now we need to calculate our test statistic. So if we want to calculate the test statistic, we need to first set up our sample proportions. So p hat a is equal to the number of successes, so that's in this example 12, over 300, that's our sample size. This is equal to 0 0.04. The sample proportion for a manufacturer B is equal to 10 over 200. There was 10 successes out of 200 samples. This is equal to 0 0.05. And lastly, we have to calculate p hat. This is for our test statistic. This is the pooled proportion. This is basically when we assume our proportions are the same, like we do in our null hypothesis, we need to use the pooled proportion in our standard error. So p hat is equal to the number of successes in A plus the number of successes in B all over the sample size of both, so the total sample size, this would be equal to 22 over 500, which is equal to 0 0.044. Okay, now let's get started by calculating the test statistic. Now that we have all our values, we can say that z is equal to p hat a minus p hat b minus our claim of zero divided by the standard error. We have to use p hat here because we're assuming that the proportions are equal to each other. We divide by 1 over Na plus 1 over Nb. This is equal to 0 0.04 minus 0 0.05 minus 0 divided by the standard error of 0 0.044, 1 minus 0 0.044, that's our pooled proportion, all times 1 over 300 plus 1 over 200. Our two sample sizes, this is then equal to a numerator value of negative 0 0.01 minus 0 is just negative 0 0.01. Take the square root of all this stuff that was in the middle here and we get a value of 0 0.0187. That's our standard error for our hypothesis test, our test statistic, and we get a test statistic value of negative 0.53. All right, so if we want to calculate our p-value, let's go ahead and draw the null distribution, which is a z standard normal distribution. We're doing a z procedure. And so we would say that our test statistic, negative 0.53, would be about right here. And the thing is, is we're doing a two-sided test. Remember, two-sided p-value, because it's a not equals. So that means that we have to find the area in both the tails. So we need to find the area below our test statistic of negative 0.53, and then the area above our, test, our positive test statistic, 0 0.53. So just looking at this, we can see that this is probably going to be a pretty large p-value. So we can find this by looking it up on a z-table.
Now on the Z table, we wanna scroll down until we find the negative 0.5 on the Z's, and we wanna scroll over to, this is the zero column, the, the, or the 0 0.01 column, the point, 0, 0, column, 0, 0.01 column, 0, 0.02 column, and then finally the 0, 0.03 column. So this is the test statistic uh, probability that falls below the test statistic of negative 0.53. So that is 0 0.29806. So the area that falls below negative 0 0.53 in the table was 0 0.29806. Zero six, but that's only one side of the distribution. We need to uh, account for this other side too. We know because the the distribution is symmetric that the area above 0.53 will be the exact same as the area below negative 0.53. So because it's symmetric, we can just basically multiply this by two to get then the two-sided p-value. So our p-value is equal to two times 0 0.29. 29806 and this is equal to 0 0.59612. So that's a really large p-value so we'll talk about that in just a second but basically this p-value is not going to be significant. Our alpha is equal to 0 0.01. Our p-value is far greater than that so if we want to draw this on a scale we have from one to zero. This would be the area in which we would reject. This is the area where we fail to reject. Basically, our significance level is 0 0.01, so anything below that we would have rejected, but this is far greater than that, 0 0.59612, so we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis based upon this p-value. So let's go ahead and calculate the confidence interval as well so we can do a full write-up. Our confidence interval is going to be equal to p hat a minus p hat b, so our two sample proportions, plus or minus a z critical value times the standard error. Now this will be slightly different than it is in the hypothesis test because in a confidence interval, we don't have a claim. We don't have any null assumptions, so we're not assuming that the proportions are equal with a confidence interval. So we just use the sampled proportions errors. So that is p hat a, one minus p hat a over n a plus p hat b, 1 minus p hat b over nb. And so this is equal to 0 0.04 minus 0 0.05 plus or minus a z critical value of 99%. So from the table, we can find that to be 2.576 times our standard error, which will be equal to 0 0.04 times 1 minus 0 0.04 divided by our sample size of 300. Plus 0 0.05 times 1 minus 0 0.05 all over our sample size of 200. All right, so what does this come out to be? We get a point estimate of negative 0 0.01 plus or minus, again, our critical value of 2.576. We get the standard error of our confidence interval to be equal to 0 0.0191. Multiply these together, we'll get our margin of error of 0 0.0492, so plus or minus negative 0 0.01 and we get a 99% confidence interval. Equal to negative 0 0.0592, 0 0.0392. So a lower bound of negative 0 0.0592 and an upper bound of 0 0.0392 three nine two which should span zero our null hypothesized value because we failed to reject the null in our p value up here so we should expect a confidence interval that spans our null value of zero 
All right, so let's go ahead and write up our conclusion in the settings. I already have kind of a setup here, and it says there is blank evidence the proportion of defective parts between manufacturer A and B are different. In this example, we have a very large p-value, so this would be no evidence. So there's no evidence that the proportion of the defective parts between manufacturers A and B are different. This is our alternative hypothesis, and this is a statement in strength for that, and there's just no evidence in favor of the alternative. Now, if we look at the, um, our significance level and whether or not we should reject the null hypothesis, we're going to fail to reject the null. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis based upon a significance level of 0 0.01 and a z-test statistic of negative 0 0.53 with a p-value of 0 0.5. Nine, six. And I'm just going to round that off. We did a 99% confidence interval, and this confidence e estimated that the difference in proportions between the manufacturers A and B is from negative 0 0.0592 to 0 0.0392, with a point estimate of negative 0 0.01. So what this implies is basically our samples estimate that the Manufacturer A will have 0 0.01 less defective parts than manufacturer B, but really the confidence interval says that the margin of error is wide enough in which there really isn't a big difference between the two companies, so their assumption is, is correct. Essentially, there's, there's no evidence that the proportions between the two are different, which means that there's more evidence that they're the same.